The following interview was conducted with Roy Johnson, Associate Director, Record Services Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, November 19, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted and to be here. Tell us where you were born and your parents in early years in high school, et cetera. Well, I was uh, born in a suburb of Chicago, Evergreen Park. Uh, my parents uh, were both uh, high school graduates, although neither of them had gone to college. We lived on the southwest side of Chicago and uh, graduated from uh, grammar school, elementary school there uh, in 1952. Uh, at that point, we moved out to uh, Evergreen Park, and uh, since Evergreen Park didn't have a high school at that time, I uh, commuted by bus into Chicago every day and, in fact, went to the same high school that both my parents had uh, gone to and uh, even had one or two of the same teachers that they had had, so it was uh, pretty much a, a family tradition. Uh, we lived in the southwest side. Uh, my dad was a uh, salesman, uh, a variety of uh, different uh, areas. My mother was a uh, homemaker and uh, stayed home. Uh, we were very uh, middle class, uh, nothing, uh, nothing special. Uh, one car, no garage. Uh, any brothers or any siblings? I had one younger brother, uh, two and a half years younger who uh, also ended up coming to Purdue and graduating from Purdue. So uh, a small family, but uh, a very close family. Right. What was high school? Any activities that you participated in? Or was, and how large was the school in your class? Well, the school uh, was one of the larger Chicago high schools, and uh, we had uh, over 2,000 students. Uh, my major activity in high school was being a part of the band program there. I had uh, had an aunt who was a professional musician and had uh, traveled uh, on the road with uh, all-girl orchestras and uh, various uh, instrumental group USO tours uh, since she graduated high school. So music had been uh, a real important part of uh, our family, uh, although neither my mother nor father played musical instruments. Well, my mother played a little bit of piano, but, uh, but I think the, the excitement of instrumental music uh, really uh, tweaked my interest. So while I was in eighth grade, my dad got me set up with a, a private instructor uh, who was in his uh, Lions Club at home and uh, started working on clarinet. And then when I went to high school, I stayed with the clarinet and spent uh, most of my living and breathing hours uh, working with band activities in high school. Sure. Were there any concerts? In, was this also for athletics? Would the band participate in athletics or not? Well, at that time, um, we had uh, a good marching band and, of course, played for all the uh, football games. But uh, pep bands in high school that long ago were not really that big. Uh, I think I may have played for a couple of uh, high school basketball games. But, sure. Did you do uh, dances then? Or, or did you play? What uh, kind no, of I was strictly a, a clarinet player. I wasn't okay. a saxophone player. Okay. So I uh, uh, was focused more on uh, concert band activities okay. and marching band. Very good. Then after high school, when you graduated from high school, what, what came next? Purdue. Oh, how did you uh, end up, uh, attend Purdue? Well, I... Uh, had been interested in engineering and uh, had visited uh, University of Illinois, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, Northwestern, and uh, ended up actually receiving scholarship offers from all three of those schools. But in talking to my high school band director, uh, he said that if you really want a good engineering school but want a really moving band program, you should take a look at Purdue because they have a brand new uh, director that's only been there two years and he is really uh, putting together a fine product. And of course that was Al Wright. So I uh, came down to visit Purdue during my senior year. What year would this have been? Uh, this would have been 55-56. Uh, okay. And uh, immediately fell in love with the campus. Uh, 
we visited on uh, gala weekend uh, in the spring and had a chance to see a Purdue marching band in the parade to uh, John Purdue's grave for the alumni ceremony. And uh, everything just fell into place. I uh, uh, visited uh, with Bob McGiver, who was the assistant director at that time, and auditioned uh, for the band, and uh, ultimately ended up receiving a, a scholarship uh, sponsored by Games Slater, who would later on uh, donate the money for Slater Center of Performing Arts. Slater Center was not built at that time. It was not built, no. Okay, good. Uh, but he had uh, donated that scholarship to the department in honor of Spots Emery. So from the very outset, I had very, very close ties with, uh, with Van and Spots and uh, Game Slater. Did you meet Spots Emmerich at any time? Yes. Okay. Uh, Make a couple comments because we he don't. He came know. back uh, a couple times. Uh, Al Wright uh, was very good about inviting him to come back to uh, Purdue to guest conduct the band at football games. And uh, so I had an opportunity to play under Spots a couple of times in the national anthem, and uh, he was quite a character. Uh, he um, had not been uh, a professional musician, even though he was director of bands, because he too was trained as an engineer here at Purdue. So he had this combination of engineering and music background, which ultimately was the same background that I developed. Super. Um, and I remember he conducted the national anthem at the, one of the games, and he held the last chord longer than any conductor I have ever heard, and he just kept bringing the crescendo up from the band and louder and louder, and by the end of the at, the audience was on its feet just cheering and cheering okay. because so many of those people still remembered spots. He'd only been retired two or three years at that time, and uh, that was really a very memorable experience. Oh, I would say so, right, yeah. So, really, I've, uh, I had a, play, a chance to play under Spots, and then have known personally all the directors that the Purdue bands have ever had. Good. We'll talk about it when we get to the band. Where did you live on campus then? Well, my freshman year, I started out in uh, what was a brand new housing area called Gable Courts, which was on the southwest side of campus just on the south side of State Street, which is where the uh, Discovery Park is now located. Mm -hmm. It was a period of rapid growth for the university, and they needed housing that could be built quickly. So it was uh, inexpensive housing, uh, single story, sort of like little motels, uh, with uh, 10 rooms per building and 20 students. And uh, at the time I moved in, uh, they didn't even have a dining facility completed. They were working on it. Uh, so uh, that first semester, I had to walk to the Union Building from out there every morning just to get breakfast before going to classes. That's a long and, walk. And uh, one of the first impressions I had of Purdue was the amount of walking that I would have to do because things compared to a one-square one block high school back in Chicago, things were so spread out, and I had blisters on my feet for the first couple of weeks until I built up that endurance. Sure, right. Uh, so I spent uh, two years out there at Gable Courts, and then uh, by that time, they, uh, the university had a chance to catch its breath and plan some permanent housing facilities. So they began building the H buildings, H1, 2, and 3, and uh, I was part of the group from Gable Courts that actually moved into H2, which is now Tarkington, and opened that facility in the fall of 58. So I uh, lived there in H2 for my final two years as an undergrad and then graduated from there. And uh, I think my nameplate is still on the door. Got to check it out, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, what year did you graduate then? I got my bachelor's in 1960. In, in what, from in, what school uh, of engineering? In school of engineering, it was uh, engineering sciences, which at that time uh, was a theoretical engineering, uh, theoretical approach to engineering mechanics. So it had uh, training in most, uh, coursework in most of the engineering areas, uh, but uh, very mathematical. Then I uh, 
went on and got a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. Here at Purdue? Here at Purdue. Okay. And uh, all that time, I was uh, a uh, graduate TA in uh, engineering, teaching courses, uh, statics, dynamics, uh, ultimately strength materials, uh, but was also still heavily involved in the band program because I'd been in the band as an undergrad my four years. I uh, had been executive officer of the band my senior year, which was sort of chief of staff, and then uh, stayed on uh, working with Al on uh, show design for the halftime shows, uh, slowly uh, taking over assisting responsibilities in rehearsals and but not. Um, ultimately, they uh, offered me a, a quarter time uh, assistantship over there as the department was growing. So uh, while I was a quarter time over in the band department, I was a half time grad student and I was a half time teaching assistant over in engineering. So I was really carrying a full load, but I, I enjoyed all of it. Sure, you were able to handle it mm -hmm. then. Then, when you finished that, uh, then you, is that when you started in the Emergency Star's office, or? Well, that, no. Can we talk a little bit about that. Uh, my career uh, took some interesting turns because after I uh, finished my master's degree, I began work on a PhD again in engineering, but was gradually becoming more and more involved in uh, the band activities, and uh, so. Eventually, uh, after I had completed all of my prelims for my PhD, uh, a position opened up in the band department as assistant director over there, full-time position. And uh, I thought long and hard on that while I was spending a summer working in the uh, aerospace industry down in Huntsville, Alabama, with a summer job at Lockheed and Missiles and Space Company and finally decided that I really enjoyed the college atmosphere, working with students. Um, I enjoyed music immensely. I enjoyed uh, the challenges uh, of working in the band department, uh, the administrative uh, skills and uh, utilizing my musical background, which I had picked up, and organizational skills, which Al appreciate it apparently. And uh, after breaking the news to my folks, <laughs> uh, I said, I'm going to be a band director. So I uh, joined the band department full time, uh, beginning with the uh, summer of 1966. And uh, that was actually uh, an auspicious year because uh, I had been with the band unit playing at Radio City Music Hall during the summer of 1963, and uh, we were invited back in 1966. So uh, Al took me uh, to New York as the assistant director of the band, and I actually made my professional conducting debut at Radio City Music Hall. Very nice. It's a nice uh, facility. I've was, been there. Oh, it is it's awesome. Uh, amazing and. The experience of working with uh, theater people and uh, the entertainment uh, industry, uh, learning how they uh, developed uh, stage shows, how to entertain the public was invaluable experience. And uh, that same uh, summer, uh, while I was working at Radio City uh, with the band, was one of Jack Mullenkoff's banner year, and it was obvious that the team, the football team, was going to be excellent that year. And uh, during the uh, summer, uh, during breaks between shows, I had all the uh, equipment for charting the halftime shows for the season in my dressing room at the Hall of Music, at uh, Music Hall. And uh, so I was working on that, and then we came back and. Uh, how long was that? Was it the whole summer for the Radio City or just uh, a couple of weeks? The first time in 63, we were there for eight weeks. Uh, the second time in 66, we were there 10 weeks. Uh, four shows a day, seven days a week. So it was a big time commitment. 
Uh, but after the last show in the evening, we could go out and explore New York a little sure. bit and whatnot. But uh, it was a uh, fascinating. Great experience. Great experience. So mm -hmm. we came back. So we had not only Radio City during the summer, but of course, at the end of that season was the Rose Bowl. So I got to. Uh, be involved the band. in all that. And did you go? You went by? Did you go by train? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. I have heard that you went by yeah. train. Yeah. Seventeen car private train, and it was an amazing experience. With all the instruments and everything too. All the instruments. We had the big drum and a box car at the end of the train, and uh, had some interesting incidents with that uh, during the course of the trip. And we had the cheerleaders with us. So it was uh, it was quite an experience. Oh, great, oh, wonderful, and we we didn't win. No. Yes, we, we did. We, that's right, we won that one. That's Fourteen right. thirteen over Southern yeah, Cal. That's, that's right. Yeah, and then you, did you take the same route coming back? No, uh, we had gone out uh, a northern route through uh, Salt Lake and then down to Las Vegas. Uh, we'd come through Denver, stopped and done a parade in Denver, uh, where it was about fourteen degrees, and uh, they took the big drum out and. Uh, at that time, uh, we had just gone to uh, uh, synthetic heads for the drum because it was getting very, very difficult to find uh, cows or cattle large enough to provide a head for them. So we had uh, gone to uh, uh, vinyl heads, and uh, it was so cold that the head got very, very brittle. And the first time they beat that head in the parade in Denver, it just split into a million different pieces. So uh, Al called uh, the chemical company that had produced it, Al Wright, and uh, they had a new head waiting for us in Los Angeles when the uh, train arrived. Okay. So we went out sort of northern route, then swung down, and then going back, we took the southern route, uh, made a uh, trip up to the Grand Canyon with the train. That's when trains were still running up to the Grand Canyon and had a chance to get off and explore there and uh, of course a group formed a block P on the edge of the Grand Canyon which is uh, really nice. Quite a great, uh, yeah, great idea. Great right? experience. Yeah. So, uh, was there a lot, and of course there were a lot of people from Purdue out there too. Oh yes. Yeah. Right. Huge, were you stay, did you stay Purdue. near the um, Coliseum where the game we, was? Uh, we actually stayed at that time on the UCLA campus in mm -hmm. one of their residence halls and uh, rehearsed on their uh, practice field. So uh, it worked out quite well. Yeah, good, okay. And uh, then- and You did a lot of the, uh, some of the arranging and things of that sort for the program? Uh, the show design, I didn't yeah. do the music arranging. Okay. Uh, Harold Walters was the uh, staff arranger at that time and had been for many years. So uh, uh, Al would say, well, let's form this or let's form that. And then it was up to me to come up with a, a layout that. Sure. that he approved and then designed all the flow charts. Uh, this was before computers. Uh, now they have software programs that do all that for you, but uh, <laughs> we had well, to do it like manually. hands-on. You know? Yeah, <laughs> very, very hands-on. <laughs> and uh, then that uh, we got back to campus. At that time, uh, Purdue was still on the uh, late semester academic calendar, so we didn't have finals until about two, uh, two weeks after we got back sure. from the Rose Bowl. And then we uh, left immediately with a group of the band for South America. So in that 12-month period, I'd had Radio City Music Hall, the Rose Bowl, and South America oh, great. The band. And it was a... Really super. Just super experiences, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then did you continue on with the band? And I stayed on with the band uh, for four years. Uh, as the assistant director? As assistant director of the marching band and had two of the concert bands also did the uh, uh, basketball pep bands and was actually leading the uh, pep band for the dedication of Mackey Arena with the big game with UCLA. So, John uh, Luden was here, wasn't he? That was, yes. Yeah. That was very, another very special memory associated with my band work. Um, but uh, after four years, uh, the gentleman who had been the grad assistant in the band department my senior year had been working on an educational administration master's uh, school administration and he had uh, accepted a position in the registrar's office uh, 
after he completed his master's degree, had kept in touch with me, and uh, they had a full-time position that was opening up in the office of the registrar. Uh, they were looking for somebody with uh, administrative experience, which I had certainly developed working in the band department. Uh, they were looking for someone with an academic background who could understand things from a faculty viewpoint and having been a graduate instructor for a number of years in engineering, uh, I had that point of view and also had the engineering background with okay. systems analysis and whatnot. And uh, so they convinced me that I had the ideal combination of qualifications for this position that they were uh, looking to fill. And uh, so I decided, what the heck, this would be a great opportunity uh, to uh, broaden my uh, experiences within the university to work with people that I had not had an opportunity to do in the band department because when you're in the band department you, you tend to be a very closed operation because the activity level is so intense. But this was uh, providing me an opportunity to work with academic advisors all campus, all over campus, uh, department heads, uh, deans, uh, becoming familiar with uh, other student service areas of the university and uh, really was uh, a great opportunity for me. So you decided to take that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What were some of the, was that when record was, tell us a little bit about what some of your responsibilities and challenges. Well, uh, during my uh, years in the registrar's office, I was uh, focused primarily in the academic records area uh, in fact, I was ultimately in charge of all the academic records and the academic transcripts. I uh, was instrumental in developing the encumbrance system, which we had to implement at that time to collect outstanding fees and monies due. So my name, my signature went out on, I can't imagine how many hundred thousand letters to students all saying you may not register or you may not get a transcript until you pay this bill. Don't so even think don't about Don't even it. think about trying, no. Uh, but I also uh, uh, gradually became uh, involved with the commencement activities. Uh, Nelson Parkers, the registrar, uh, was chairman of the commencement committee. He was a grand, uh, grand man and got me involved in the commencement and ultimately as I moved up the ranks in the registrar's office and assumed more responsibility uh, I became uh, vice chair of the commencement committee so had uh, primary responsibility for most of the arrangements pertaining to commencement and uh, then uh, ultimately assuming the uh, role of orator for commencements uh, when the uh, former gentleman who had been doing it uh, retired. Okay. So. Excuse me, at that time there were only two? Was it just a spring and a... Um, at that time it spring? was just uh, spring? spring commencements. Okay. And... Uh, no August or... No August or December. Uh, we had... Uh, when I had graduated, uh, we were able to cover all the graduates in two ceremonies in uh, the spring, and then it went to three ceremonies, uh, and then to four ceremonies. Uh, at the same time, uh, President Beering uh, was aware that many students, uh, and we were providing him this data, that many students who had graduated either in August or December were always invited to come back to participate in the ceremony once they had completed their degree, but that very few did because by then they were located in permanent positions all over the country or going to school. And so um, uh, the president uh, with the recommendation of the commencement committee finally uh, agreed that we should indeed add commencements in December and at the end of the summer session. So uh, we did that and that gave us uh, seven ceremonies a year yeah. in addition to the 
ceremonies uh, at the regional campuses. But did you? I was going to ask you about the regional. Did you take? Uh, were you involved with any of the planning there, or did they do that? No. Each of the regional campuses did their own planning. Um, but President Barron, the president goes. The president and uh, the registrar, as chair of the university uh, commencement committee, always would go to those regional campus okay. commencements with the president. Uh, there was one year when uh, uh, the registrar was not able to uh, make the trip to a couple of those, and uh, so as vice chair, I got to fill in and travel on the president's plane and <laughs> do all those uh, good things. Those good things. That right. was really neat. Sure. Uh, it was nice uh, seeing what the other campuses were doing with their commencements and how different each ceremony was depending upon the local environment. But at the same time, uh, that we really did have so much in common as sure. a single university. All right. If in the case of say Fort Wayne, where they were, the, they would have a I would have a separate one, and Purdue would have a separate one. Uh, say because Fort Wayne and, and uh, Fort Wayne uh, was a joint ceremony. Oh, was it? Okay. So they would have both presidents, and uh, all the students would be uh, participating in the in the ceremony. And then they would get the their respective time. diploma either from one school or the other. Is yeah. that what it was? Yes. Okay. Okay. What about uh, tech? How did technology change the activities in the registrar's office? Helped a little bit, or uh, the paperless society generated more paper than I had ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> the more usage we made of computers, the more reports were generated and the more output from registration was generated and the more things there were to go through to find answers. Um, I hesitate to think what the impact on uh, the forests in the United States over the years has been with the addition of computers because <laughs> even at home I go through reams and reams of paper a year just in I know. operation. Just catalogs just for openers. Yeah. You know. In the meantime... But, but the, uh, the development of computer systems uh, enabled us to uh, make a lot of uh, improvements in efficiency in the office of the registrar. Uh, the registration system at Purdue was, I think, the first one in the country that had been computerized. Uh, Nelson Parkhurst was a real leader in that field. Uh, we'd been one of the very first universities to have our academic records computerized. And uh, all of these things were uh, really milestones in the, in the history of uh, using technology at the college level. Sure, okay. Now, in the meantime, did you keep your contact with the band department? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, Let's share once, something. Once I uh, went to the registrar's office, uh, Al uh, continued to use me as a uh, conductor during the summer with uh, some all-star concert, high school concert bands that he was taking to Europe during that period of time. But he also had me uh, announcing the indoor band concerts uh, throughout the year. Uh, Al Wright had been a real fan of the service bands in Washington, D.C., the United States Marine Band, the Navy Band, the Army Band. And all of those bands, uh, when they went on tour for concerts, used uh, stand-up announcers to announce the music to the audience and tell them a little bit about the background of the music, uh, as opposed to generating uh, volumes and volumes of printed program notes, which most audience members never had a chance to read. So Al had uh, begun using me uh, as an announcer, even while I was still on the, uh, the staff over there, uh, but continued that role uh, once I moved to the registrar's office, because he knew he enjoyed my voice and what I, the research I did in putting the script together and, and whatnot. So then, uh, uh, just a couple of years after I moved to the registrar's office, uh, the gentleman who had been serving as announcer for the marching band uh, left uh, Purdue. He had been uh, a news anchor on Channel 18 and was transferred to the CBS outlet in Louisville. So Al asked me if I would uh, be willing to uh, take on the role of 
announcing for the All-American Marching Band. And uh, in about three microseconds, I said yes. And uh, I believe my first uh, season as announcer was the fall of 1973. So I've been the, uh, the voice of the Purdue Band uh, ever since. You could be in the same league with uh, Johnny DeCamp, the voice of Purdue, as yes. they often refer to. Yeah. Uh, the I Am an American, how long has that been uh, said? Was that started, and how did that come about? Um, Was that taken? It, did you do it, that when you took it, over in It, it uh, had actually uh, been first utilized in the fall of 1966. Uh, Al was going to do a, um, a patriotic show uh, because at that time there was a lot of unrest about the uh, Vietnam War and uh, the hippie movements and everything, and he felt that this was a statement that Purdue could make uh, countering some of those negative things. And uh, so he uh, was having lunch one day at the uh, downtown or restaurant downtown, and they had a paper placemat on the table that had some patriotic poems on it. And he saw some things there that he liked, so he took that uh, placemat back to the office and put together what we now know as I Am an American. And we used it for the first time in a halftime show that fall of 66. And the uh, response from the crowd was just uh, great. Lots of phone calls, lots of letters coming into the office. And uh, so Al, being very uh, perceptive of audience response and uh, knowing a good thing when he saw it, said, this is something that needs to become part of our weekly pregame show and ultimately has become a Purdue tradition. Yes, it has. And it's very rare. Yeah. So it was used, uh, uh, it was used at uh, uh, several home games that year and then was used at the Rose Bowl game that year for the first time with mm -hmm. Southern Cal Band and Purdue Band doing the national anthem together. Everybody really likes it. I've mm -hmm. gone to the games for a number of years and I yeah. agree. Did you go to uh, some of the special events? Now they go to the Indy 500. Do you, did you accompany the band there? Yes. Oh. Uh, and they still, that's a long, been a long time. Yes. Uh, this will be the band's 90th anniversary this year doing the 500. And uh, I, of course, marched uh, in the band as an undergrad and then uh, assisted uh, as a uh, graduate student. Um, when I was assistant director, of course, I was working on the track with the band and everything. And then uh, once I moved <coughs> to the registrar's office and relinquished my direct uh, band responsibilities working with Purdue Band, Al had me working with the parade of bands which they always have all the high school bands that come in for the 500 Festival do a parade around the track uh, before the race festivities start. And uh, so I was always on the track getting those bands lined up and getting them stepped off at an appropriate time interval to make sure that everybody had a chance to get around the track, uh, communicating with the people in the uh, uh, PA area at the starting line as to who was coming next. And uh, so I did that for uh, many, 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 many years. Uh, I think uh, it's only about three years now that I've uh, stopped doing that because as age uh, creeps up on us, we find it harder and harder on our knees and our back to stand around <laughs> on the track for five hours before the race actually sure. starts. But other than that, I had done every 500-mile uh, race, with the exception of one when I had some uh, surgery, uh, since I'd been a freshman. That's great. What a so wonderful I, tradition. That's, yeah. really, that's really nice. Yeah. Do you go to the bowl games as well? Been to every bowl game with the band okay. that Purdue has ever played. And I've always had uh, either uh, assistant director for the first Rose Bowl and then the announcer for every trip since. Um, let me ask you about the alumni band. How did that come about? Um, looking back on the years that I've been here, I mm -hmm. don't recall it. 
Well, Al started that uh, oh, okay. during his tenure. Okay. Uh, before he retired in 1970, about 71. So it would probably have been in the uh, mid 60s okay. that he got that uh, going. Uh, we always had a lot of band alumni coming back for games and uh, coming out to hear the band, watch the band perform. And uh, I think some of the other universities were experimenting with this around the country and uh, knowing how loyal our Purdue band members are, sure. uh, it really was a natural and it, it took off now, and has been a mainstay every other year. Uh, used to, I thought at one time they came every year, but now I think it's every other year, is that correct? It's generally been every other year. Oh, okay. uh, the okay. only exception that I can remember was the year that the band received the Sudler Award, which is sort of the Heisman Trophy of marching bands. And uh, that, I think, came on an even number year. Normally we do it in the odd number of years. But for that event, uh, we pulled together an alumni band, and it was a huge group. And yeah. So uh, every other year is uh, about as often as... Uh, you get you get it's a pretty good. good you get a pretty good turnout. Oh, we have uh, 400, 450. And they have limited time to practice, don't mm -hmm. they? They usually get to campus uh, late Friday. Uh, sometimes we have a chance to have a music rehearsal Friday night, and then uh, Saturday morning they'll go out to the drill field and uh, practice for an hour and a half, and that's all the practice they get. So uh, they get. Uh, drill charts mailed to them in advance so they can figure out where they're going to be and the sure. music goes out. And uh, so in that hour and a half time period, they put the show together. Yeah. And, That's pretty good. Uh, it doesn't change much from alumni band to alumni band. So uh, once they've done it, they pretty know, they pretty much yeah. know what to expect. One other thing, um, do they go one away game? Is that how that works out? Do the band only go to? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we used to go to two away games uh, when travel was much cheaper than it is now and when the band was a little smaller than it is now. Uh, but uh, now uh, the entire band just goes to one away game mm -hmm. each year. Okay. It's, uh, it's very expensive to travel, and uh, the athletic department pays the expenses for the marching band to travel. And uh, they pay for the music that we use and the printing of the drill charts and things. So uh, with uh, so much dependent upon uh, football attendance, um, we're in a different situation financially here than you are, say, at Michigan or Penn State, where they're guaranteed 95 or 100,000 people for every game. Uh, so uh, we go with the flow, and uh, sure. That's the athletic point. department and the band, and I think, have a very, very good relationship working together. And, mm -hmm. and they do. It's just it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Have they made any changes? Did they always have the honor guard and things that they have beforehand, before the you know the, the pregame thing at the, at Ross Aid? There's always been a right. uh, flag uh, color guard from the ROTC. Sure. Branches, right. Yeah. It's it's just a nice beginning mm -hmm. to the thing there. A um, couple of things. How about, tell us a little bit about the campus in the 60s uh, and the 70s. The early, we're trying to fill in the gaps of what mm -hmm. the university was like around that time. What enrollment wasn't as large. Uh, when I started in the fall of 56, I think the enrollment was about 12,500. And the ratio was a little bit more than four men to each female. And uh, that ratio gradually went down over the years as more and more women applied as uh, the non-engineering areas uh, continued to expand as liberal arts expanded as education expanded and uh, it's it's interesting because when you're on campus continually for a number of periods of years you don't realize how much more dense the campus is becoming with the addition of new buildings. Because we're not spreading out, we're, uh, well, in general, uh, we have a few new buildings now on the west side of University Street, but in general, the campus is still occupying the same space that it did 53 years ago when I came. Right. 
And uh, it's only when alumni come back who have uh, been away for many years and you talk with them and they comment, my gosh, how the campus has grown. Uh, you hear that, that comment. That you realize uh, how, how many new buildings have been built, built on campus that we just take for granted. Uh, but I think the greatest impression that I have now of the change in campus is the huge number of students when you try to drive around anywhere near campus during a class break. Uh, driving didn't used to be that much of a problem and now you have pedestrians and bicycles and motorcycles and cars and you take your life buses. In your uh, yes, exactly. The addition of all the city buses has really changed the traffic situation sure, on our campus. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about any awards and honors that you've gotten that you'd like to share with us. Any that's coming? Oh my. Uh, well, going back to uh, my senior year, I was uh, named the Outstanding Military Bandsman that year. and. Uh, received a trophy at what was on the President's Review, which they used to have on the intramural fields out west of campus every year. Uh, I think uh, most of the awards that I've had have come through uh, my involvement with the band uh, and the band fraternity, Cap Kappa Psi, that I've been involved with since I was a uh, sophomore. Uh, I also served as a district governor for that organization and have been an advisor for the local chapter in the Purdue Band for uh, probably about 40, 45 years mm -hmm. and uh, have received various uh, awards through them at the, from the national organization and the district organization. Oh, good. Uh, That's very nice. I think uh, the most special award, though, uh, came... Uh, from President Beering at, uh, well, two really special things that I remember. Uh, when I was uh, getting ready to uh, announce the uh, honorary degree recipients at the final commencement that I was participating in, uh, President Beering interrupted as I, before I had a chance to start the first nominee and uh, announced to everyone that this would be my uh, final uh, commencement and called me up to the front lectern and he presented me with the uh, the president's award of honor which uh, completely floored me uh, in appreciation for all my work with commencements and uh, the work I'd done as orator and the care that I'd taken through the years in researching all the student names, particularly the international students, and making sure that I was pronouncing them correctly. And so he presented that to me at uh, the commencement with uh, my wife and family and whatnot in the audience, and that really uh, made it <laughs> very extra special. Very, very extra special. And, uh, I really had to uh, pull myself together to proceed with the <laughs> orations for the honorary the, degrees the day at that hand, time. Right? Yeah, uh, I think the other one that really, uh, really floored me was uh, homecoming uh, two years ago, when uh, at the end of the halftime show, without telling me anything about it. Uh, the the game announcer came in and took over the microphone and uh, began reciting uh, some of my background involvement and the fact that I had completed 50 years of involvement with the band. And uh, while he was doing that, the band formed my name on the field outlined with a birthday cake. And uh, I was just absolutely speechless. <laughs> Good. Boiler up. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about family? Did you meet your wife here? Talk about your family. Yes, I met my wife here, but uh, neither of us were students at the time. Uh, we met uh, while she was director of, uh, uh, she was the foods manager at Windsor Halls on campus. 
And uh, my boss, of course, was Nelson Parkhurst. His nephew married Sarah's boss, who was the manager of Windsor Hall's, Sue Graham. And uh, Sue and my boss decided that, gee, here were two single people, very intelligent people, and they really ought to meet. So they arranged uh, for uh, Park and I to uh, have lunch over at uh, Windsor Courts, and Sarah hosted us, and uh, that was our first meeting, and uh, Sarah later uh, recalls that uh, during the course of the luncheon, uh, most every foods supervisor that she had on the staff there managed to have an excuse to go through the dining room and check out this guy that was having lunch with their boss. <laughs> so we met there and uh, <laughs> uh, five years later we were married. That's very nice. We were, uh, you know, we were both confirmed bachelors at that time. <laughs> and uh, so it, uh, we had established two separate households and uh, once we were married, uh, trying to consolidate and fit everything into uh, the small house was really quite a challenge because we both had to give up a lot of things. But, uh, <laughs> Part so we met, and then uh, she uh, immediately became involved with the band and uh, was soon uh, asked to serve as a faculty advisor for the band sorority. And uh, so we've been... Uh, advisors for the two uh, honorary groups, you know, for many, many, many years. Very nice. Yeah. How about uh, your post-Purdue retirement activities? What have you been doing? Uh, since retiring, uh, and I consider retirement from Purdue as merely a cessation of income, uh, I've been involved in a variety of things, very involved in the local Kiwanis Club, uh, the past president of that, uh, very involved in things at our church, downtown Central Presbyterian Church, uh, but have uh, been very involved with the Purdue Retirees Association and served uh, a two-year term as president of that uh, group and uh, really have been very, very involved with them ever since. Mm -hmm. Do they, has that grown over the years? That started, doesn't Dr. Hansen start that? Yes, uh, Dr. Hansen... Uh, uh, met with uh, retirees who felt that there really needed to be a voice for retirees coming to the university and uh, that uh, retirees still had lots to contribute to the university both financially and from their store of knowledge. So President Hansen uh, created uh, the Purdue uh, let's see, Advisory Council for Retirees and uh, Harlan White, who had been the Director of Admissions, whom I'd known <laughs> when I started in the Registrar's Office, uh, was the first chair of that and really was instrumental then in getting the organization formed. And it's been very, very viable ever since. Um, you have quite a few active committees, too. Benefits yes. is one of the ones that people yes, talk about. Yes, benefits, uh, trips and tours, right. uh, publications. Uh, we have six or seven newsletters that go out which I year. get from the they send it to me and it's mm -hmm. very nice yeah nice they do a nice yeah. job and uh, hospitality committees and uh, we now have an endowment committee and uh, work very very closely uh, with the university we have we always have uh, a liaison at the upper level of the university uh, uh, when I first got involved Ken Burns who was vice president and treasurer at that time, uh, was our liaison. And uh, uh, Fred Ford had done it uh, before that. And uh, now Murray Blackwelder has uh, been our liaison. And uh, really, uh, uh, these people have done a good job of being a voice for Purdue retirees inside the president's inner circle. And, and I, also, I you were one of the members on the one of the committees for the um, of the new strategic plan. Somebody mm -hmm. was on one of yes. those committees yes. too. Yes, we had is, several people. Really, yeah, which is really nice. Um, now, I think you may address this, but I always ask this: You have a favorite Purdue tradition, although you've alluded to some. Any other one that you wanted to share? And then an outstanding event in your life. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, th I think the one of the other than I am an American, uh, I think the Boilermaker special, to me, uh, epitomizes the the spirit and the uniqueness of the Purdue student body. Uh, so creative. Uh, I've been affiliated with the Reamer Club uh, since I was an undergrad. I was a member as an undergrad. And uh, just admire the dedication that that group of young people have to serve in the university and trying to generate university spirit and represent the university in a variety of uh, situations. So I would think I am an American and the Boilermaker Special um, are good. Are, yeah. are really my, my top two. Okay. Do you have, what about an outstanding event? Would you like to share with the researchers? Well, it, uh, I think the most challenging event for me uh, was doing I Am an American at the first halftime show following 9-11. The emotion of the moment, uh, the emotion of the crowd, the emotion of the band, um, the flags which had been painted all the way around the field at Ross Aid, just uh, combined into a uh, an unforgettable moment, and uh, it's something I will never forget. We hope we never have to experience anything like that again, but it's still it epitomized uh, what that tradition is all about. Right, yeah. One question I would like to ask, they're doing, uh, how do they arrange those flyovers that they have? Sometimes people ask me that. They're, does the band handle no. that? No, oh, no, okay. that is done, I'm sure, through the athletic department and the okay. special events office. Okay, it really is uh, sitting around with the people, they, they really, they always want to mm -hmm. be sure to get there in time for it so yeah. that they don't miss it. Yeah. Yes, uh, in fact, we have one coming up this yes, week. Yes, I know, and for the, some Purdue uh, people are going to be flying, uh, which is nice. It, uh, it really is very nerve-wracking because they, they work so hard to make the timing exact at the conclusion of the national anthem. But um, football teams being what they are, we know when they're supposed to leave the field at the end of their pregame practice, but they don't always get off in time. And uh, sometimes we'll be delayed just a bit in getting the pregame show started, or uh, the tempos may, uh, they may have gone, uh, they may have left the field early and uh, they'll get the halftime show started a little bit early, and sometimes the timing is not exactly the way we want it, but Nobody. it always uh, it always comes at an appropriate point in the show, and, uh, it, yeah, nobody knows, and uh, it's still... Uh, it's still a great a kickoff great of event. the game. Uh, the frustrating thing for me is, is sitting in the press box, I can never look out and up and see them fly over. <laughs> right. We do watch the pictures in the paper. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Any closing comments, Roy, that you'd like to make? I think that uh, my association with uh, Purdue has really been a marvelous experience uh, through the years. I've watched the university grow. i watched the student body grow, the number of disciplines grow, the uh, the quality of the programs increase, the quality of the marching band increase. And I've had uh, a unique opportunity, I think, to interact with just a wonderful, wonderful group of students for the past 53 years. And uh, look forward to having uh, more such opportunities in the future good. for years to come. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you, Roy. This concludes the end. Thank you very much.